back to why the title is Test in a, key, in a Teacup a bit later. But I'll, first of all, I'm just going to mention um, the Bioprotection Centre. So in New Zealand we have um, what are called CORES, Centres of Research Excellent, Excellence. There's a number of them dotted around the country. This particular one focuses on um, our land, um, either uh, conservation estates or farmed, farm managed uh, uh, landscapes. And it's all really about pests and disease and how do we manage them, how do we control them, these kinds of things. It's biosecurity, those kinds of um, issues. It has seven partner organisations, um, three CRIs, and four universities including Massey. And actually, today is my last day working for them, so I'll throw in this, this advertisement. If you're interested, go and, go and look them. But what I'm going to talk, to talk about today is some of the research that I've been doing around pests and diseases. If you look at what's up there, some of them you're going to recognise straight away. Top right, carry die back. In the middle, myrtle rust. And bottom left, mycoplasma bovis. Obviously that's not mycoplasma bovis, but it's the affected organism. Um, bottom in the middle, potato late blight might not be recognisable immediately, but that's the causative agent of the um, Irish potato famine. So it had massive impacts on um, on, on Ireland. Basically people leaving, going to the United States, those kinds of things. So pests and disease, yeah sure they cause problems um, on, on organisms, but they actually have a wide range of impacts on the environment and on us and on, on how, we, how, we, how we live. Um, I'm going to start out just mentioning this document. Uh, it's a, um, this is from the executive summary of this working paper from the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, it's a bit dated now, it's 2014, but it has a number of interesting comments in it. First of all, we need to develop new tools. Basically what the Royal Society recognises is that we're underprepared in terms of our ability to manage pests, to understand where they, where they occur, what kind of impacts they're having, and how to deal with them. Um, the second is that we need more monitoring, and basically that comes down to a one, we need more trained professionals involved in uh, biosecurity and bioprotection. But we also need more citizen scientists, more citizen science around bioprotection, around pests and disease. We, get, we see a lot of interest in conservation, but it's less interesting to go out and study some, uh, you know, some pest or disease. But ultimately, we need four million pairs of eyes, all looking out for the next disease organism. Looking for the next sign that there's been some incursion, some new disease is going to cause a problem. So I just want you to keep these kinds of things in mind as we work our way through. So, let's have a look at what we do right now. What do we do right now when it comes to pests and disease in terms of diagnostics? in terms of detecting where that organism is and, and what it might be doing there. Basically, um, we do what I would term reactive sampling. So on the left hand side of the top there is a, a leaf with uh, myrtle rust on it. Um, what happens is you'll have some guys out in the field, some doc or MPI workers or, or volunteers, they will be going through an, uh, a, a location looking for those yellow pustules. When they see those yellow pustules, they'll whip that leaf off and it will be sent to the lab to be identified. Doesn't quite make sense, does it? Because there aren't many things in the environment with bright yellow pustules. If you see that on a rama rama plant, you're pretty sure straight away that that's, um, that's myrtle rust, but that's the system we run. That's how we apply DNA diagnostics. We use it as a tool to confirm 
an initial diagnosis. The other um, example I have up there is, um, is drinking water. We do use uh, DNA uh, diagnostics to, um, to track disease in or um, contaminants in water or on, on foodstuffs. But again, that tends to be uh, post hoc. Once you know someone's got sick, you go and try and find out where did that um, contamination occur. You're not looking for it before it causes a problem. Now, I've got three steps here once you've, once you've sampled, right? You send the thing off to the lab, it's tested, and the results come back. There's an extra step in there often. And that's that you've got to culture the pathogen. If the pathogen is a microorganism, if it's a virus, if it's a bacterium, or if it's a fungus, often what you will need to do is grow it. You need to isolate it from the source, from the environment, and grow it so you can get enough of it to test. That's a bit of a problem. Because often things either grow very slowly, or they don't grow at all. And you're suddenly in a, trapped in a situation where you can't test for the very thing you want to, to identify. So there are problems. So I'm going to pick on MPI here. And it's not because, it's not for any particular reason other than that they publish this information. If I go to a vet clinic, I have to be a vet in order to sign in and find out the prices for the different testing, so I can't do that. But MPI are nice in that, and they, they provide this information. The reason that we use DNA diagnostics predominantly as a reactive tool is cost and time. You can see here the Animal Health Laboratory, that's at Wallaceville in, uh, in Wellington. They're going to charge you somewhere in the region of $150 to $250 to do a test if you send them a sample. Now, often that's sampling for very particular um, types of disease. Not everything goes to Wallaceville. A lot of your standard testing from a vet will just go to one of the vet health labs. There's a, um, I'm not sure that there's one in, in Wanganui, but there's certainly one in Palmerston North. Um, the plant health lab. Their, their, their charges are a little bit more reasonable, somewhere in the range of $100 to $200. But time's the other killer. It takes them around 10 days to get you a, a, a result back. And if they require culturing, it can be as much as four weeks. Okay? So you can imagine that if you've got a disease if you if you're this disease on your farm, for example, um, you're not going to be that keen on having seen a disease. Your plants are already sick, your animals are already sick. To send something off that's going to cost you two hundred and fifty dollars, and you're going to have to wait a week to maybe three, four weeks before you make a decision about what to do. That doesn't work. That's not what you want. All that time that you're waiting, things are just getting worse and worse. And why is it? Why does it take that kind of time? It really comes down to this. It's not because the people aren't trying. Don't get me wrong, it's not because of the people. Um, you've got to have a specialist lab. You've got to have a bunch of specialist equipment. You've got to have a bunch of specialist reagents, so the actual tests that you're running, and you've got to have a bunch of specialist people. All those things cost money. And so you have to make all that back. And that's why you charge money. The, the time taken, well, that's going to be because you've got a number of people or a, a waiting list, basically, for testing. Or, more unfortunately, you've got an outbreak. So, Mycoplasma bovis was uh, officially recognised as occurring in New Zealand, I think it was 12 months ago, it was first, was first announced, what's the date on here? The 25th. So you're looking at just on a year. Okay. 
And in that time period, the Wallaceville lab has done nothing but mycoplasma. This report came out on the 20th of this month. And it describes an e a series of emails um, obtained under the Official Secrets Act or the Official Information Act that went back and forth within MPI between their staff at Wallaceville and the higher ups, the managers. And basically saying, we cannot continue to work seven days a week and keep up with the workload. We're getting 7,000 samples a week. We have the capacity to, part to process about 2,000. We can't keep doing it. If we have one of our staff fall sick, or we have another outbreak, when, or a, an outbreak of another disease, we're not going to be able to keep up. We're not going to be able to deal with the problem. So, you have all these things coming together. Centralised lab systems have their place, don't get me wrong, but in these situations, they actually create more problems <coughs> than they solve. Just to reiterate, it's because they're costly to run and it's time consuming to do the tests. Um, we do everything reactively because of that and it locks citizen science out. Okay. Although the, the, um, the Royal Society wants to see more citizen science involved in bioprotection and biosecurity, a lot of it you're locked out of as a citizen scientist, as a general public, because the DNA testing is treated as the gold standard. They want that, that uh, let's say, certification on top. They want to know that for sure, mycoplasma is present, for example, before they uh, um, sacrifice an entire herd. But the real value of DNA diagnostics is not in that kind of reactive, in that reactive space. It's about being proactive and monitoring what's going on before it happens. And that's true both of um, institutional <coughs> science and citizen science. When I say proactive, what do I mean? Well, if I was to go out and be a little bit proactive and go hunting for, my, uh, for um, myrtle rust, I'd go looking and visually I'd find it. But this is the end of the myrtle rust life cycle. These yellow dots are the fruiting bodies. They're essentially the mushrooms of myrtle rust. They're already producing spores that are going to lead to the next generation of myrtle rust. They're already infecting the neighbouring plants. Okay. The myrtle rust life cycle is specifically designed. It doesn't kill the plant outright first go round. What it does is it causes the, leaf, the uh, plant to drop all its leaves. And as soon as the leaves come back, it infects again from a neighbouring plant. And the leaves drop again. And a plant can usually cope with that two or three times but you're basically running down its stores every time it has to make a new set of leaves and eventually it can't cope and it, it just doesn't make any new leaves and it dies. But what you really want to be able to do is know whether myrtle rust is present before it gets to the stage. Okay? You'd like to be able to go perhaps and swap surfaces. It's a, it has windblown spores. So, can you swap hard surfaces? Can you swap, swap leaves of susceptible plants? If you can do those things and then test those for, um, for myrtle rust, you can detect it before you can see it. You may be able to do something about it. At this point, once you're at this point, the only thing you can do is rip up that plant and burn it. But if you could... Myrtle rust is susceptible to, to spray, but the problem is it just gets to, a, to the point where it's, um, it's spread so wide that you can't spray every plant. But if you can identify it on a, on a few plants or one plant in location before it kind of takes over, you can do something about it.
about it. You can stop it in its tracks. That's a uh, Myrtle Rust is an interesting example because it's more about the disease and the host are kind of quite um, intimately linked. But that's not always the case. In plant pathology, there's this idea of a disease triangle. And you can think about it like this. Let's say that um, your neighbor or one of the guys at work has a cold. So the pathogen is present in your environment. You're exposed. Okay? If you are a susceptible host, or you know, let's say you're healthy, you've been eating your vegetables, you've been getting enough sleep, all those kinds of things, you're fairly resistant. If you live in a nice warm house, it's not too damp, you've not got a very good environment and it's likely that you won't catch cold. But if you are exposed to that pathogen, maybe you didn't have, you, you know, your diet's not the greatest. Maybe you do live in a, in a drafty, damp house. You're more likely to get disease. And that's pretty much what the disease triangle works on. It's the idea that you have to have the pathogen, the host, and suitable environmental conditions present in order for disease to develop. So the idea is that, that the pathogen and the disease are not always linked. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Sometimes the pathogen can be present, but not the disease. I'm going to come to um, carry dieback as an example. And this is because we actually don't know. It's a case where we don't currently know. The pathogen, or at least one of its life stages, is on the right hand side. And the idea there is if the disease, I'm sorry the picture hasn't come up very well, if the disease symptoms are only ever where the pathogen is, you, you, might come, you might use some particular management strategies. If the disease is only ever where the pathogen is, you need to worry about the spread of the pathogen. You need to worry about the vectors carrying the pathogen. You need to control where they're going. And you could spend a lot of money on that, and you might control the disease. But if the disease doesn't always occur, where the pathogen does. Sorry, that's not quite right. If the pathogen has a much wider distribution, but the disease is only occurring in certain patches within that distribution, then simply controlling the vectors is probably not your best plan of attack. What that suggests is that, in fact, there's some environmental um, overlay. There's something about the environmental the environment that this tree is growing in that means that it's susceptible to the pathogen. Because there are other trees around there that are also exposed, but they're not dying. They've not caught the disease. And we don't know that yet. We actually don't know whether um, carry dieback, although we know carry um, are pretty much once they get dieback, they die pretty much 100% mortality, we actually don't know whether every tree that has been exposed to the pathogen has died. And that's really important because in that case, if, it, if that's not the case, or sorry, if that is the case, then you're um, worrying about your vectors, they probably come lower down the list. There are probably other things that we should be looking at. What are the environmental triggers what, why has the carry become more susceptible or the pathogen more virulent? Suddenly the vectors become less important. So we need to know these things. We need, we need ways of being able to track these pathogens. What would that look like? Well, if we start up here, what I'd like to be able to do is sample proactively or reactively, it doesn't matter. We're different situations will call for different um, 
different sampling strategies. But the idea is that you could basically swab a surface. You don't need to see the disease, you just need to swab it and then be able to test it. Test that swab to see if that disease is present. What I'd like to do is have the test be usable by anybody. Make it simple enough that anybody can use it. I don't want a test that requires me to go out and run it. I don't want a test that requires um, weeks of training in order to be able to, to set it up and run it. What I want is something that probably in a day or two somebody can feel comfortable that they're going to be able to use. And what I want it to be able to do is to give me results in, in this particular case, about 30 to 45 minutes in order to make a decision about what to do. Now, I've put up spraying there just because it's an easy thing to find on the internet. That's not because I'm, I want to say that everything will be solved if we spray, but it's a management decision. It's one possible management decision. And that's what this testing is all about. This testing is about getting people to be able to make a decision about managing a problem immediately. And the dotted line at the top is that I want it to be cheap enough that you can repeat that cycle. Because one test doesn't really solve the problem. You need to be able to test repeatedly so you can test whether the management decision that you're making is having an effect. Whether it's an efficient way of, of managing the disease. Are you continuing to see spread? Have, has the disease completely died out, or the pathogen died out, or is it simply you've knocked it down, and it will just come back in a matter of time? So that's the kind of thing that I think we would need. <coughs> this, um, this idea, you know, it's not just my idea, it stems from this. This is the um, WHO assured criteria. And basically for any kind of um, diagnostic testing, they have these, these criteria. They want it to be affordable. They want it to be specific. That is, it doesn't pick up everything. It picks up the disease it's looking for. They want it to be sensitive. They want it to pick up um, a low number of, of cells or, or individuals. It needs to be user friendly, so basically that means it doesn't require me to run it. It doesn't require someone um, with extensive training. Um, it needs to be rapid and robust. It needs to take a day at most, not weeks and weeks. It needs to be effectively equipment free. WHO is looking at things like Ebola. It's looking at things like um, TB in resource poor countries. You don't want to have to plug in to a war <coughs> in West Africa in order to run an Ebola test. Because you're unlikely to find the plug. Okay? So they want things that can be run either without equipment or reasonably off a battery pack. And it needs to be deliverable to end users. So basically it can go and be point of care. You're doing it right there. You're not having to, shift, uh, to, to ship it off-site. So, for example, the two little uh, myrtle rust cases here at the, um, the council offices, for those to be, um, for the, for the uh, diagnosis to be confirmed, those went to Auckland. So they were packed up, they were double bagged, the outside of the bag was sterilised, and then that was put in a courier pack and sent to Auckland to be, to be um, tested. You don't want that. You want that to be done here. So that you can be sure of what you've got, and then make a decision. Now, what am I going to do? So why, if you had this, would it, would it change things? Wouldn't it just be the same? Well, it would actually open up a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do. 
this was for another talk, so it includes health down here. But really, health is the driver. Health is making a lot of things, especially human health, is making a lot of this possible. We already have tests of this type for things like Ebola, malaria, um, TB. Um, there's a whole range of them. Okay, so those, those tests are available already. But once you have this diagnostic cap capacity, you can do all kinds of stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't do right now because it's not what I refer to as a high value target. Ebola, TB, these are high value targets because you know they, they're causing death. And you know, at quite high rates. But um, things like wildlife health are the animals that you're shifting between animals that you're translocating between different reserves. Do they carry disease? Are they carrying a, a potential disease? We don't really know, and it's not what I would refer to as high value. Some people would, but financially it's not high value. You can do things like wildlife monitoring. <coughs> uh, we're involved in a project right now where we're looking at whether or not we can test for um, trout spawning in rivers remotely just by sampling water and looking for trout DNA. Uh, you can look at import biosecurity. You can swap surfaces of imported uh, organisms or imported fruits, for example, at the border and test them for um, common, uh, common diseases or diseases that you wouldn't want to be brought into the country. You could do food quality testing. So you could look um, at uh, leaf, leaf products, green leaf products, or fish, um, seafood products. You could test for, for things like listeria and, and whatnot on the surface of those before they were packaged and before they were sent out. Currently, that is done, but this has to be packaged and it's sent off to a lab to be done and it sits around at the um, packaging plant for several days waiting, so it cuts through the shelf life of that product. Um, so there are a whole range of things that could be done or could be improved upon if, it, um, <laughs> if this kind of testing was, was doable straight away. Um, Doing this kind of testing is useful in two different ways. One of those ways is that you can make an informed decision right then about what's right in front of you. Okay? Um, you know how to deal with, or you have a, a decision tree to know how to deal with a particular uh, outcome. Uh, so for example, um, if I was a farmer and I, you know, I have a particular crop planted, what I would typically do right now is simply spray. I would know based on experience that at a certain particular time of year, with a particular crop, I was likely to have a problem with disease, so I would simply spray. I would do it prophylactically just to stop any chance, because if I waited until I saw that disease, it's too late, I'm suffering losses, I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to spray. Um, but what would, you, what, would, uh, what would it look like if the farmer was able to go along and routinely test and then only spray once the pathogen, once the disease, got above a certain level? He could cut the amount of spray that he would need to use. Some years it might be that he wouldn't have to spray at all because the pathogen never reached that threshold level. That, you know, it's not gonna, it's never gonna remove all, all sprays, I'm not trying to suggest that it would, but it would reduce the amount of sprays. That has benefits for the farmer because sprays are quite frankly quite expensive. Um, it reduces the env environmental impacts and it also limits the chances of the evolution of resistance. So pathogens are always evolving to, evolving countermeasures essentially to our sprays. Um, things like nematodes, we've been drenching them in sheep for forever, and they're be beginning to show signs of resistance. So drenches, 
are not going to be able to control nematodes in sheep forever. So we need ways of improving our control strategies. Um, another way that um, these kinds of testing regimes might help, or changes to these testing regimes might help, um, Mycoplasma bovis is a, is a really interesting case because um, I'm sure any of you who are paying attention will have heard basically that the testing that we have is rubbish. It's been said often that the testing of, of uh, mycoplasma is rubbish. It's a difficult one because the organism itself is hiding. It's not constantly shed. So the only sure way to test a cow for mycoplasma bovis is take its head off. And that's not great for the cow and it kind of defeats the purpose. The reason is that the mycoplasma is actually down here in the um, tonsillar crypts and they're difficult to access unless the head is off. You can get a, a vet has got to get its arm all the way in and then they can never be sure whether the, um, the swab's got actually into the crypt. You can, she, he or she can fish around in there but you're never quite sure. Um, so at the moment, so there's that problem about how do you detect it. Okay, because it won't always be in every sample. It certainly is not, exp it's expressed in milk sometimes, but not all the time. Sometimes it's in the saliva. Sometimes it's in the semen. It's never in the blood. So, you know, it's about taking enough, sam enough of the right samples. So we have two tests available to us. One is actually a blood test, but it's looking for antibodies. And antibody tests are notoriously, um, they're not particularly specific. So there's about 20% error rate on the mycoplasma test. So you get about 20% false positives, which is not a bad thing. You're, over, you're overdoing it, you're not underdoing it. Um, and then you have a PCR test. And that has really high sensitivity, high specificity. It's actually a really good test. Except mycoplasma is not present all the time in every sample. And it's a bit expensive. It's $50 a test. Well, that's what MPI budget's at. Um, so you can see that we have a cheap test that kind of works, or an expensive option that works really well, but you can't guarantee you're getting the right sample. And the problem is that even if you took that really expensive test and repeated it, okay, you've got to do the stats say that you've got to do it 10 times on any given animal in order to be sure that it's negative. So one animal, 50, 10 times, $500 per animal. You've got 500 animals in your herd or 1,000 animals in your herd. That racks up. No farmer's going to pay that. Okay, so a new test that's cheap and usable might change the way that we're managing mycoplasma. We might not be going down the route of simply slaughtering entire herds. The last one that I'm going to mention is water quality, and it's the same for food. Basically, what we do right now is we have to wait. Samples are taken, they're spread on a little plate, they're kept warm, the bacteria grow, and then we identify the bacteria. It's about a 24-hour process. But all that time, that water's continuing to flow to people, and if it does contain a nasty, people in the population, people in the town are continuing to drink a nasty. So what we could be doing, and what is being done in some places, is that run and in uh, testing uh, using uh, a, a rapid diagnostic, a rapid DNA diagnostic. And what you can do is on a particular bore, you could turn it off. If you detect that there's E. coli in the bore, you just simply turn that bore off and you leave the other ones running because they're clean. And then you wait the 24 hours until you get your confirmatory plate. You're not continuing to run that bore for 24 hours um, because you have no information. You have some information that indicates there's a contaminant, you switch off that bore and you wait for the, um, for the standard testing to confirm or otherwise. So it's a triage kind of technology in that case. The other way that you might use these, these, um, these tests or this testing 
is large scale. If you can imagine that you go from having a centralized lab collecting a few samples here and there, it's not very easy to make very much out of that. But suddenly to go to having a lot of people collecting a lot of data, collecting um, positives and negatives all across the countryside. If you can centralize that data, that information, you can begin to track disease over a range of different spatial and temporal scales. So you can watch the disease profile over time. And you can begin to work out a couple of different things. One is, are there non-chemical ways in which we can control this organism or this disease? Could we be doing things like moving stock to certain paddocks or to certain um, away from certain areas to limit their exposure to disease at certain times of the year? You can also assess over time the effectiveness of any control measure. Okay, so that's all good, right? That's why you would want to do this kind of testing. How do you do it? <coughs> so DNA testing works on the idea that you have, um, you're looking for a word or a sentence in the string of DNA. So you can imagine that DNA, your, your genome, as a book. The book has all the instructions to make you. Okay? What you're looking for is a little sentence, let's say, in that book that defines that organism. No other organism has it. No other pathogen has it. Just that one. So you're looking for that one specific sentence that says, yes, I'm that thing. And if you imagine you have to go into the local library, you have to read all the books until you find that one sentence, it's going to take you an awfully long time. So there are a couple of technologies that are used. And the idea is they've got a way of homing in on that one sentence. Okay? And what they do when they find it, is they copy it. All these tests are based on, on, a, on an idea that is um, DNA amplification, which is basically DNA copying. Right? What, what you do is you have a, an enzyme that likes to copy DNA, and you provide it with a, um, a targeting mechanism that only goes after that sentence <coughs> in the book. Um, the most commonly, the most common one, the one most people know about is PCR or polymerase chain reaction. Um, it's essentially a lab-based technology. It was developed in the 1980s when you had grad students who were quite happy just to have a tube in their hand and move it between three different water baths at three different <coughs> temperatures. Now we have a, a machine that does it for us. Um, but that machine, I'm sorry, I couldn't bring one with me. Um, I'm trying to think what, what would give you a sense of, of scale. Um, it probably has a footprint similar to my computer. And I've just turned my computer off. Um, but, but it's much heavier. Because inside that machine, it needs to move between three different temperatures. So it's, it's quite a heavy, bulky piece of equipment. It's not something you can carry around with you. If you take the, um, the book and the photocopying analogy further, the idea of this machine is that, is the, is the local librarian in, in tonight? Oh, good, because I'm going to tell you, you go down to the library and you rip a page out of the book. <laughs> so you rip that page out that you want, you put it in the photocopier, and you push go and it makes a copy. And then you push go and it makes a copy. And you sit there, it's quite slow each time. And the idea is the light has to shine on that page and make a copy. And in, this, in the analogy, the light is the heating up of, that, of, that, um, of the DNA of the reaction. And you're making hundreds of thousands of individual sheets of paper. So you're making hundreds of thousands of individual little pieces of DNA and you suddenly get to a point where I can detect that. 
I can see that. Either I can run it on a, on a gel or I can detect it because it's got a little, um, di a little light marker on it that I can look at it fluorescently. Okay? So basically, PCR, it's a lab-based technology simply because the machine is so big. <coughs> the enzyme that it uses is a little bit sensitive. It likes nice clean DNA and if I'm going out in the field and I want to do it away from the lab, I don't always get that. And it's a bit expensive. The instrument is probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, and the consumables, depending on the flavour of PCR you're using, can be quite expensive. The alternative, which is they've kind of come up in the last five to so years, or five to ten years, are the isothermal amplification. Now, isothermal means at one temperature. So you don't need that big bulky machine to change temperatures. Um, that's the machine. I can run a DNA test on that machine. Uh, it's, really, it's really a relatively simple device. It's very, I can pass around, it's fairly robust. It's designed to go into the field. So um, unless you break the lid off it, um, my, my boss is not going to... Me or anything. Um, it's a $3,000 piece of equipment. It's still not cheap, but it's a lot better than a PCR machine. The enzyme technology that goes into it, there are several of them. The one that I'm going to talk about for a couple of minutes is fairly robust to DNA quality. So you can do really simple DNA extractions in the field and get results. Um, the one I'm going to talk about is also cheaper. So I told you that the mycoplasma bovis test is being budgeted at about $50. The test, same test in this machine would probably be about... The test itself is 2 to $3. It will depend on how much you want to you know, budget out the person's time. If it's um, one of your own staff members, it becomes part of their job, there's no budget for time. But if you require a new staff member, it depends how much you pay them. Um, the testing, is, the setup's much simpler. Um, we're designing tests that can be run by, um, we think can be run by the general public. Um, the way that they're set up, things will come dried down, so you just simply add the, add the, the DNA in on top. There's a simple DNA extraction procedure. Um, basically, you put it in a tube, you rattle it, you transfer with a little eyedropper, and then you run the test. Um, the results of the test, you'll see there's nothing there. Um, the machine talks by Bluetooth to either an um, Android, that particular one is an Android, either a tablet or a phone. Um, if the phone's hooked up, you can immediately transfer the information to a central repository and you can start to do your analysis and things like that. So, just at this point for clarity and going to the cow disease, which is probably of interest to me and probably others, somebody's still got to get down there and get that the accurate thing I heard you yes. say earlier. You would have to. You still have to do that. The advantage of this, though, is that you can, for the same fifty dollars, you can do the ten tests that you require to be able to say your. Um, your cow's negative. So there's no, there is, you're right, there is no advantage in terms of this getting around the problem of mycoplasma not being shed all the time. That's simply a biological issue that we don't really have at the moment any way around. But we can get around it by making the individual tests cheaper and then doing more of them. So I'm just going to come back to why I say tests in a teacup. That particular device is set up currently to hold temperature at 65 degrees. And it detects the DNA using a fluorescent dye. So as the DNA has been copied, it makes more fluorescent dye. <coughs> and um, if you see me afterwards, I'm, it's a bit hard to show it on, on here. The machine reads that and it picks up and produces a little S-bend when um, there's a positive result. But you don't need that device 
you can run the test in a teacup. If you have a thermometer and you put hot water in here and you maintain that water, you, in all honesty you wouldn't use a teacup, you'd use a thermos, but as long as you hold that temperature, you just drop your tube in that hot water and you wait. And there are ways of doing setting up the, the test such that it will change colour or such that it will become cloudy rather than needing a fluorescent marker like that machine will run. So the whole thing becomes even cheaper because you don't need your $3,000 to buy the machine. Mm -hmm. um, I will go one... So that one, that machine that and the testing that I'm going to just mention in a minute is set up for what's called the lamp. Um, but there are other isothermal um, uh, enzyme systems, and I just need to do that. They work at 37 degrees, so if I hold it, I hold it in my hand, the test will work. Okay, or I put it in, maybe that's not quite so good, it's cold out, put it in my armpit, and it will work, it'll run. <laughs> Alright, so let's have a few examples just, just to finish off. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the technology that we're working on is, is called is, um, loop-mediated amplification. So if I take that photocopy um, analogy, the photocopier in this case is not taking individual pages. Just think about the photocopier having been replaced with a roll of paper. And instead of having to take that, you know, the light coming on the photocopier and passing over each time, it takes it once, it stores it, and then you just roll the paper out and press it. Okay? And so, rather than having that, that slowdown, each time the light has to pass and has to copy, you just keep pushing it out fast. All right? So, a lamp test will generate about 50 times as much DNA as a PCR test. Um, that is, is not very meaningful, except that it means that you detect in a very short amount of time. Most of the tests that we're running detect the the organism in under 20 minutes. So you start the machine running and in 20 minutes you know whether your sample is, contains the pathogen or not. <coughs> uh, if you go to the literature, um, there's about 20,000, or sorry, about 2,000 published tests of, uh, are out there and available. Since, um, I think it's 2000 was when LAMP was first published itself. It's an accelerating rate. The first couple of years you see almost none and then suddenly it takes off. These are in fields ranging from infectious disease, food safety, clinical diagnostics, all kinds of things. And the reason people are doing it is because it's relatively cheap, it's really robust, and you can take it in the field. You can do it anywhere. It's a big deal. If I'm, you know, traditionally, if I'm wanting to do diagnostics, I'm looking at thinking about medicine. Because that's where all the money is. People put money into medicine. They don't put money into caridiac or myrtle rust or, you know, local problems. This is something that you can make, or I can make a diagnostic relatively cheaply and relatively quickly, and it's a, it has immediate application. It's not something that I need a, co a company in America to say, hey, look, New Zealand's got a problem, I should go in there and help the mountains and give them a diagnostic, because that ain't going to happen. We're too small a market. The only way we get testing is if it's a worldwide problem and we can run on the coattails. Alright, so let's look at a couple of examples. The first one is, um, I'm going to mention a scientific name, but that's just because I'm going to make a comment about fungal biologists. Um, this is obviously Tuatara, and it gets what I will refer to as athlete's foot. Um, Paranana zeziopsis australialis. Um, I think Fungal biologists have an inferiority complex, so they give hard names, <laughs> trying to trip people up. Um, basically, what happened was, these animals were taken into Auckland Zoo, 
for transfer. Auckland is a, a, a hub for transfer around the, the outer island, outer Auckland Islands for transferring between populations. They got sick while they were at the zoo. They got athlete's foot. Basically small to medium sized lesions. Okay, the scales would start to fall. It wasn't very attractive. Um, didn't, animals didn't seem to mind it too much. Um, I know of only one animal that died, and that was probably the, the fungus probably finished it off. It had a number of other rather horrific things going on. Um, basically, the testing that was being done was this, this strategy. <coughs> And it was taking eight weeks because they were having to grow fungus. Now in that time, the, fun the animals were being treated, the lesions would heal, they'd get the results back confirming that there was a disease, and they would need a new test in order to say, no, the animal was clear. But of course by that stage it had developed a new lesion. So that wasn't very practical. Um, but what we did was we um, designed a test. Um, and in the end, we did about 800 of them, and we did about uh, we did repeated testing of the animals in Auckland and several other zoos and, and, and um, captive populations. We also went and got a large number of collections via DOC because they were worried. They were worried that it was an organism that had turned up at the zoo off one of the um, uh, one of the animals that had recently come in from Australia. So they were worried that they were going to be releasing these animals back into the um, environment um, and then suddenly be giving all of New Zealand's tuatara uh, a rather nasty disease. But what it turns out um, was that the pathogen was widespread outside of the zoo. What we were able to do was build a test that was able to, we were actually able to swab animals. The original tests, you needed to pull the scales out of that lesion, send that off, grind it up, and um, and then grow up this, this fungus. Um, what we were able to do was simply swab animals. So Doc were able to go out and swab animals in the wild populations, and what we were able to show was that the fungus was also present outside of, of the zoo. Of